a message to me. So there's a drop down, drop down menu and you can find Stefan Blaney and just put your name in the chat and I'll call on people to speak in the order that they put their names. Um, finally, just to let people know that we are recording the workshop this evening. And um, so far we've been just putting out the sort of raw recordings on the website for people to listen back to or listen to if they haven't been able to make it. Uh, we're also looking into how we can make sort of more interesting podcast versions of the workshops, but uh, that's a work in progress at the moment. Um, and also, uh, Holly Furman will be live tweeting the event tonight. And if you want to join in, tweet about the workshop, you can use the hashtag HistoryX. So our speakers tonight, on the activist side, we've got uh, Aaron McElroy from the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project in the US. Uh, that's a data visualization, data analysis, and storytelling collective uh, who document gentrification and they've also been doing some really interesting work on uh, the response to the coronavirus crisis from landlords and renter resistance. Uh, then we've got John Bibby and Rachel Cohen from the Radical Statistics Group, uh, which is a collective of researchers and statisticians in the UK with a common interest in the political implications of their work. Uh, then we've got a great uh, panel of historians as well. So we've got Edward Higgs from the University of Essex, Oz Frankel uh, from the New School for Social Research in New York, and also uh, History Act's co-founder, Guy Beckett. And we also, I know we've got some uh, extra guests in the audience who couldn't make the panel, but uh, we're hoping can contribute to discussion. Um, so I think without further ado, I'll uh, invite Erin to kick off. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to be part of this meeting, um, virtual as it is, and also to learn more about all the work that you all are, are doing. So thank you. Um, I think that what would make the most sense would be for me to share my screen as I talk, because I'm going to walk you through a few different maps, if that's OK. Um, <clears throat> so let me just do that right now. All right, so um, yeah, so my name's Erin. I'm a co-founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. This is our website. Um, as was mentioned, we're a data visualization and digital cartography and also a multimedia storytelling collective that has been documenting um, evictions and gentrification um, for some time. We were founded in 2013, kind of in the height of this era that people call the tech boom 2.0 in San Francisco, in which uh, tech companies uh, were generating massive amounts of wealth, but real estate speculators were taking advantage of that um, and evicting disproportionately uh, poor and working class tenants of color. Um, so we formed again here in California. <laughs> um, we, we currently have chapters also in New York and Los Angeles. My work has primarily been with the Bay Area chapter, which is the oldest, the, the LA and the New York chapters were founded in 2017. So for the sake of um, what I'll be presenting on today, I'll, I'll stay in the Bay Area, um, but also, I guess, span out to some national and international efforts we're doing as well. Um, but yeah, before getting into what we're doing in the wake of the pandemic, I just wanted to, to kind of give a little context about what we've been doing uh, for the last seven years and kind of how we're getting to the moment in which we're able to respond um, as we are. Um, <clears throat> so. So again, for context, I know that the US is, it's a big can of worms. It's really hard to understand all of the different policies at play. Um, in, in the US, um, most cities don't have uh, rental protections or protections against evictions. Um, historically, uh, rent control was gained in different cities in the US in the 70s after a lot of tenant organizing. Um, up until recently, there were just about uh, 18 cities in all of California that had rent control, which which means that rents can't go up beyond about 2% each year um, and that tenants can't get evicted generally. Um, often rent control is accompanied by um, protections against what are called no-fault evictions uh, in which tenants get evicted for, for doing nothing wrong. Um, but again, these protections are very minimal and there have been a lot of laws written by friends of the real estate industry after um, rent control was passed in the late 70s and early 80s to kind of prevent it from being very strong, uh, which is why uh, in San Francisco, um, 
there have been uh, a massive wave of evictions, um, both what are considered fault evictions and no-fault evictions. So fault evictions take place when tenants do break their lease, um, no-fault evictions take place when they don't. Um, in California, the LOS Act is one of these landlord laws that enable landlords to evict tenants for having done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, and, and politically, we're against both both genres of evictions. But um, what we found is that these no-fault evictions um, really began to peak up with the dot-com boom in the late 1990s, um, and then again with this this tech boom in the basically 2011, 2012, 2013 era. And what we found was that disproportionately, the evictors themselves um, are, are not individual humans or aren't listed as such, but generally are listed as um, these corporate shell companies. So what's happening is that tenants are having their buildings bought by these shell companies of larger investment companies, um, often through what are called limited liability companies in the US, but these LLCs, basically shell companies. So what's happening is tenants are getting evicted generally for doing very little, nothing wrong. Um, uh, sometimes for doing these like petty things like bringing a bike in the stairwell and then sometimes because they can't pay rent because rents also in in California or in San Francisco right now are averaging between three and four thousand dollars a month so it's it's a very unaffordable city for most um, so tenants are getting evicted for all sorts of things and have been and so we've been as a project providing data that can be useful in fighting evictions so we do a lot of research to figure out who the landlords themselves are um, well, and just so you know, this is our first map that we made, which shows where LS evictions are, are taking place in the city um, and allows tenants to figure out who their landlord is. Um, uh, so that's, this is the first map that we made. But we, we realized that it would be actually more effective to provide these profiles on particular evictors. Uh, so this is currently San Francisco's um, most notorious evictor, Veritas which if you if you look on the right operates through all of these different uh, shell companies so you can just get a sense as to how massive this investment company is and you can see all these properties on the left are properties that they own um, and they have evicted some of them um, so we provide this data because we know that if tenants are being evicted it's more powerful than to, for, it's more powerful for them to find other tenants in other buildings owned by the same landlord in order to fight back um, and engage in like, um, multi-building uh, uh, struggles. So a lot of what we do and have been doing as, as a project is identifying these serial landlord uh, uh, connections and the shell companies in which they operate. Um, these are all of the Wall Street uh, investment companies, properties in California, um, most of which have all been consolidated and are owned by Blackstone uh, or Invitation Homes. Um, so, so this is just some context around what we do. We also do a lot of narrative-based work. So this is an oral history map that we've been working on for some time, which um, in which we're interviewing folks who are uh, facing eviction and um, learning about their different struggles uh, to, to remain in their homes. Um, we also paint murals and do a lot of community programming and events. So this is a mural that we made um, of, of our oral history map a few years back. Uh, that has a basically a call the wall function so passers-by can um, call a phone number and hear different oral histories um, and it's just a way for us to bring some of our data and our mapping offline uh, and engage with uh, different community um, in different ways. Uh, most of what we do is at this point also done with a lot of different community partners. Um, we're part of what's called the San Francisco Anti-Displacement Coalition which unites about 20 different housing orgs organizations um, in the city, uh, all of which are, are supporting housing justice struggles in various ways, from offering legal support to um, providing uh, tenant counseling for tenants facing harassment or eviction. Um, <clears throat> we also have been making different printed material. This is a zine we produced last year called Black Exodus, which uh, chronicles Black histories of displacement in San Francisco with a focus on the uh, urban renewal redevelopment era of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which really um, saw this huge wave of um, Black displacement um, and Black evictions of Black communities in San Francisco, um, which continue today. In, in our own analysis, we found that um, 
black tenants are overrepresented by 300% when it comes to evictions um, to date. So it's uh, the eviction crisis is extremely uh, racist um, in terms of who's being displaced. Um, but so that's, that's some context. Um, when the pandemic began, um, there was a lot of effort to uh, work uh, on different policy initiatives on the local level to to enact what are called eviction moratoriums, um, and basically freezes on evictions, given that so many tenants were unable to pay rent. Um, the U.S. Um, has been, it was really late to respond uh, to the pandemic, um, and the, the sort of protections the government's provided federally are very, um, very weak. Uh, so there's a federal stimulus package in which residents making under $75,000 a year are eligible for $1,200. Um, but many people haven't even gotten that yet. It's been very hard for people to file for unemployment. Um, some people like indigenous communities and undocumented folks haven't been able to get um, any benefits more or less. Um, and then even for people who do get $1,200, again, if rent costs $3,000 a month, um, that's not going to do that much. So while we've been fighting for eviction moratoriums, um, locally, one of the big campaigns has been uh, to cancel rent. And, and now federally, there are other initiatives as well. Um, and there are different solidarity groups and mutual aid groups that have been um, emerging in order to offer local support and resources for folks who need food, who need help paying rent, um, also who need help figuring out how to tell their landlords they're going to be unable to pay rent. Um, this is the site of the Bay Area Rent Strike, which is a really new uh, local initiative that's trying to um, do some of this. And uh, what we've done as a project is uh, help with mapping and data collection. So this is a map um, that's actually, uh, well, you can zoom out. It's um, a map of different tenant protections, uh, so anything that you're seeing green here means that a tenant protection has, has passed, um, but also rent strikes. Um, so we're collecting, people can crowdsource and submit their own um, stories of, as to why they're going on rent strike and also if they are looking for um, support. So we are able to share the back end and all the data being collected with um, a collective such as the Barrier and Rent Strike. We're also working with um, Again, the Anti-Displacement Coalition in San Francisco and statewide, this group's called Tenants Together, um, but basically to show the data in order to better provide uh, tenants with material so that they can fight back. Um, there are like landlord letters on this site too. So if you wanna send a letter to your landlord saying you're, you'll be unable to pay rent, um, there are different templates that, that folks have been working on so that the letter can be legally sound. Um, yeah, so this, this is the map itself when we zoom out, we just added national data to it and we're currently working on, um, we're going to change this color schema so that it's not just pink and green. Pink right now means that um, there's a moratorium or some sort of tenant protection in the works, but it hasn't been passed yet. Green means that something's been passed, but some of the tenant protections are far stronger than others. Some are, are it's just basically nothing. Um, so we're working on this way to rank all of the um, tenant protections according to a pretty complex criteria um, that we've been developing with a bunch of community partners. So the sort of next step for this map will be to implement that ranking system. Um, but for the time being, um, we have the different protections that we've been able to find and different ways, again, that anybody can submit protections. So if you realize there's a protection in your county, your city, um, state, province, country, you can submit it uh, directly to the map. Um, and similarly, uh, if, you, if you're going on rent strike or if there's a rent strike effort or initiative underway in your locale, you can submit that too. Um, so that's basically the way the map's working right now. Um, we've also been collecting data around um, landlord retaliation. So often after tenants tell the landlords that they're going on rent strike um, or that they're asking for some rent reduction, uh, landlords are, are retaliating in various ways and threatening tenants um, and, and spreading a lot of misinformation. So we've been beginning to collect this too. Um, and again, offering tenants legal support who um, 
it might need or, or want legal support around retaliation. Um, one of the other kind of bizarre phenomena that we've been seeing is this increase of um, tenant screening companies who, who generally screen tenants to let landlords know if they should or shouldn't rent to tenants. And some of these companies also allow for like online rental payments. But there are now companies that are um, asking landlords to report if uh, their tenants have been un unable to pay rent. And then what happens is that data around those tenants gets used in, in the future to basically blacklist those tenants from the ability to rent um, other properties. And this has been going on already in the US. It's, it's a technology that we really saw emerge out of the 2008 foreclosure crisis um, with the emergence of the subfield of, of real estate called property technology. So um, there are a lot of prop tech is, is its own separate story and I won't get into it so much, but in a sense, like we've seen this consolidation of real estate um, and big tech and startups alike and tech venture capital, um, this consolidation working to, um, I don't know, about landlordism and, and real estate speculation um, and gentrification. So in a sense, what we're doing is trying to provide technology that, that does the opposite, um, that, that furthers the work of housing justice. Um, and then just lastly, I'll end with this. This is a tool that you won't find on our website because we haven't officially released it yet, but we've been developing it for, um, uh, I guess, say about a year and a half in collaboration again with um, a lot of different community partners, but it's a tool in which you can look up an address uh, or an LLC or a shell company um, and learn about what the corporate sort of connections are to that LLC or that unit. So you can see here, um, I just looked at Veritas, which is again, the biggest investment company in San Francisco. And you can see the different um, properties associated with it and these different shell companies. And again, um, we were already working on this, but we were asked to speed up its development in the wake of the pandemic. Um, tenants can use it to find other buildings owned by, by their landlord. Um, so that's, something we're still developing. We're, we're about to do a bunch of workshops with different tenant orgs this week to share the tool in its current state um, and, and hope that it will be uh, useful. Um, it also, this is kind of one of the cool things is it it visualizes all the different connections um, between the shell companies and, and allows tenants to do research on um, property ownership. So yeah, so I, um, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I know I just shared a lot of stuff really quickly, but I was just trying to get through it all. But that's that's essentially what we've been up to. Um, and I'd be happy to, to field questions later. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, so now uh, we're going to move on to the, the Radical Statistics Collective. And I think we're going to have um, John Bibby and Rachel Cohen splitting the time from RadStats. Uh, so John, do you want to start off? Uh, you'll need to unmute. Yep, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so, hello everybody. Uh, my name is John Bibby. Uh, I live in York, England, and uh, I've been asked to talk a bit about Radical Statistics, which is a UK-based group, although we've got quite a lot of overseas members, uh, but we need more. And uh, is, the, is the first screen up? I can't see it yet, but it's coming, is it? Right, there we are. So, um, that's just a bit of background with our website at the, at the bottom. Um, and uh, the, the, these slides will be going up on that website after this meeting. Next slide, please. Um, I want to start firstly by just thanking everybody who's organized this group uh, and I'm interested to be in touch with history acts that I haven't heard of till quite recently. Uh, can I have the next slide please? Uh, the, the, this next slide basically says uh, what radical statistics is, a little bit about the history. Uh, we've been going for nearly 50 years, started in 1975. Um, major concerns, we, we are mainly people who are actually actively involved in statistics in one way or another. Um, statistics in public policy. Of, of a left-wing slant, um, uh, but particularly concerned, our major concerns are mystifying use of statistical language, demystifying statistics, lack of community control, um, the power structures within, within which the statistical workers work, and how social problems get fragmented into specialist fields, which makes them very difficult to follow, obscure and connected. Um, just like to blow our own trumpet about some of our major achievements, if I can call it that. 
The first thing is that really we're, we're still alive after nearly 50 years and lots of left-wing organizations don't last that long. We've had over 20 publications. Uh, we, we have a, a journal, the Radical Statistics Journal, of which we're currently preparing number 126. So that's I think we've lost John there. Uh, John, are you still there? Uh, give John a minute to... Oh, sorry, John, we lost you there for a minute. Um, go ahead. Sorry, what's the problem? Uh, sorry, uh, your audio just cut out for a minute. But, um, oh, yeah. right. Okay. So um, I was just saying about some of our major achievements, which are on that slide. Um, next slide, please. Maybe I'm speaking too quickly. Um, the, uh, the, the journal, as I say, uh, comes out two or three issues a year. The first 125 of them are all available online at our website, and we're currently producing number 126, which is a, a special on coronavirus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our history. As I say, we started in 1975, and in fact, on the next slide, you see at the top, as it were, our, our first journal. It's called the newsletter, and at the bottom, you see our A5, our last three journals, which have a total of about um, 150 pages in the total of those three. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, we, we have changed a bit over the years. The next slide shows the, um, the front pages of our, our first newsletters, which were sort of A5 mimeographed. Some of you are probably far too young to know what that means, but anyhow, I won't go into that. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we try to have a touch of humour, and the next one has one of my favourite um, cartoons about uh, statistics. It's not just dry facts, it also has a lot of scope for imagination. Uh, next slide, please. I'd just like to say a little bit about the context in which Radstat, as a parallel with things that were happening about 150 years ago, when there were a lot of statistical societies being established all over the world. And first, the context about us, we were established in the 1970s, which was an era of new radical movements uh, in the UK, just as it was in many other countries I know. We were based on Poland Street with a lot of other sort of left-wing organizations. Uh, and in particular, the British Society for the Social Responsibility of Science was a group that we had a lot of interaction with in the first few years. Um, of all those groups, Radstats is one of the few survivors. Now, just a little parallel with the 1830s. Um, Eddie Higgs may be able to query this, but I think one can argue that there were parallels going on in, uh, in the 1830s, which was an era of similar movements, including lots of local statistical societies, and also involved in interest in social reform, stroke social control. Um, one of them, um, the Statistical Society of London, is now the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, there was an even earlier one in London called the Statistical Society of London. It, it seems to have died after a couple of years, that one did, but in its initial publication, I rather liked its motto. The motto was, every line a moral and every page a history. Um, the London Statistical Society was interested in statistics as a means to social reform and social control, as were other similar organizations. Uh, next slide, please, just shows the front page of the publication in 1827. Okay, which, um, Again, it's got that every line of moral, every page of history at, at the bottom. You'll notice that it's statistical illustrations of the British Empire. And there were lots of um, publications around that time. Um, and one could even argue that a lot of the statistics development and the trade routes and so on were part of the imperial legacy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next slide shows, as, as you were, the, the mission statement of the original organization. And I just want to pick up a few. Um, phrases from here. Uh, it talks about statistical information depending on authenticity of sources, accuracy of detail, and no motive or desire, it says, but that of the exhibition of facts. And this question of what we mean by facts, and are they as it were real hard and out there, or are they socially constructed, is one of the issues that we continue to come back to. So that's the 1820s. Now jumping back to the 1870s in the next slide, please. Um, here are some of our early publications. At our first meeting at the beginning of 1975, we established six working groups um, on, on uh, education, teaching, health. Uh, we've also had race, nuclear armaments, and, and several other things. 
education, the education group actually, some of you will know of Harvey Goldstein, who sadly died uh, at the beginning, well, about a month ago, uh, as out of, um, he, was, he was killed as, as a victim of COVID. He was actually involved from the beginning and uh, he set up this educational study group at our first meeting in 1975. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this cartoon appeared early on, and I wouldn't be surprised if Harvey had actually pulled it out, uh, parodying educational research. The ultimate aim is to persuade. So we, we, we tried to get an argument that uh, you, you, you can't think of any other. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, just gives an indication of the sorts of things that were in some of our early issues of the Radstats Journal, uh, education, health, housing, finance, and these issues, of course, still crop up um, continually uh, in our current work. Next slide, please. 1970s was an interesting time um, in the Royal Statistical Society, which is a very sort of respectable organization, but in a sense, it became a bit less respectable in 1977 when members of radical statistics, it's sometimes called the coup. It's not quite a coup, but there was an attempt to establish um, Campbell Adamson, who was president of the Confederation of British Industries as the, um, as the president of the organization. And we set up a counter candidate who, much to our surprise, um, beat Campbell Adamson. And this led to substantial changes in the Royal Statistical Society. Now, I have to say, I think it also led to changes with us. I think it was about the time when we be began to be gentrified. And that is always a risk with um, ac activist groups, I think. That, that cozying up to those who are in power is always rather dangerous, as I'm sure you're all well aware. Uh, next slide, please. I'm now jumping back to the present, as it were. And I'm going to be followed in a few seconds, moments, by Rachel, who is going to it basically takes us to the future, I hope, Rachel. Um, we are currently developing uh, the next edition of our journal, which is a coronavirus special. And this is a, a rapid fire thing. It's happening very quickly. Uh, the idea was first mooted in the middle of April. The deadline for articles was two weeks later, and we're hoping to get it to the printers at the end of next week. So it, it will all have happened in about a month from beginning to end. It will be on our website as a... Um, uh, as a PDF. And we've had an amazing number of articles from an amazing range of places. Cuba, Palestine, I mean, some of the usual suspects, France, Italy, Germany, and so on, but Cuba, Palestine, Slovenia, Vietnam, India, uh, we, we've had articles about or from all those places. And a range, of, a range of subjects. Some of them are to do with ethnic divisions, statistical impact, um, well, the, the, the impact of the coronavirus, um, and statistical measures of that, something about gender differences, something about the modeling and the models and the ethics of it. So not just the technical side, indeed not mainly the technical side. It's, these are not technical articles, that they're, they're more methodological in the sort of philosophical sense and looking at data articles. Um, an interesting one from Italy as well, which has also produced a very quick fire journal called Pandemia. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Yes, yeah, so now where next? Um, I just want to throw in four, four suggestions, uh, which are things that perhaps Radstat should be doing. Um, one is starting with this meeting, perhaps, meeting historians, engaging across disciplines and indeed across communities. Uh, second is I think we need alliances which say evidence is important, as is coherent reasoning. So we should be creating alliances for evidence, um, and for coherent reasoning and challenging shoddy evidence and shoddy reasoning. And that leads on to the fourth point, which is not the final point, but the final one I want to make now, which is that statistical literacy and political literacy are intertwined. Uh, and they should both be viewed along with literacy and numeracy as human rights. Uh, and next slide, please, I think just says thank you over and out. Um, so, yes, thank you very much. So that's all I have to say, I look forward to people's comments, and I think Rachel is going to follow me for several minutes now. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks, Ron. So now uh, Rachel Cohen, also from Radstats. Hi. So my name is Rachel. I'm a member of Radstats. I, in my other life, I'm a sociologist as well. Um, for a few years, I was the editor of Radstats Journal. I'm not at the moment, but I guess um, I wanted to say a few things about kind of my perspective of what RADSATS is and where that comes from and how that links to some of the questions that we're dealing with now. And I think as RADSATS, we recognise that statistics are implicated in forms of managing and monitoring um, 
and that reproduces forms of inequality and also subjects many of us to forms of corporate and governmental control. So it's about recognising that statistics are not necessarily positive, um, but at the same time that statistics comprise socially meaningful knowledge. And that therefore it's important that we both understand how these statistics are produced and are able to produce our own statistical knowledge. Therefore, a radical approach to statistics is to some extent um, what some of my colleagues would say is kind of just good critical data analysis, but it involves asking these kind of four questions. Firstly, what do we count and what do we not count? So are deaths in care homes included in the COVID-19 death rates? Um, is ethnicity recorded on death certificates or in test results? And can differences by ethnicity be identified and identified in the same ways across different populations around the world? Secondly, how do we count? Is a pair of gloves one glove or two gloves, two items of PPE or one? This has become a huge political debate and it's literally like how do we count things that seem like very obvious things to count. We can also think about um, discussion over the economic outcomes and unemployment and when is unemployment unemployment? Are precarious workers who have contingent jobs unemployed now? Are self-employed workers who can't claim unemployment benefit unemployed? Are furloughed workers who may be retained but may not be unemployed? So there's lots of questions about what, how do we count a particular concept and what that means. Thirdly, who has control over the data? So if we input our data into an app, which many of us are going to soon start doing, or if this records automatically whether or not we have a temperature and who we pass by in the streets, can the company behind the app use the data for specified and named um, purposes or for future unspecified purposes? It may be useful if there are future unnamed purposes. For example, we've seen retrospective analysis and tests which have shown that COVID-19 was in France in December. This is reusing data in ways it wasn't originally used and re-looking at analysis. But do we want to necessarily give, the, um, give control over all data to um, private companies, to the government? Um, in other contexts, we see employers who use health monitoring apps normally to manage employee well-being, but more pointedly to identify and eliminate gaps and speed up work. So we know that when companies control data, they use those data in order to achieve corporate outcomes that are to their advantage. Fourthly, who has the capacity to analyse data? And this probably speaks to some of the things that John was getting at at the end of what he was talking about. And of course, capacity may include skills, technology, time, whether paid or unpaid time. Um, and we want to know to what extent is the capacity concentrated amongst groups with shared agendas or paid for by companies of particular interests? And how does that capacity um, and its location impact what questions are deemed relevant, what questions are asked and which are ignored? So as I noted, you'll hear from lots of social scientists that a lot of these questions comprise a sort of normal part of good science, despite them always being asked. What makes the approach radical, therefore, the associated acknowledgement that all of these questions, what we count, how we count, who has control over the data, and who has capacity to analyse the data, are framed by and enmeshed within relationships of unequal power. That means, for instance, recognising that companies are required to act in the interest of shareholders and have huge incentives to produce and control data that facilitates shareholder profit, whether by withholding negative data findings or promoting those that accord with their interests. It also means recognising the ways in which some groups are disempowered and objectified by statistics. For instance, in the UK, BAME death rates are nearly twice that for white residents, while residents of poorer inner city areas like Newham or Brent had by mid-April death rates of over 1.4 per thousand. Yet, by and large, these groups are excluded from both decisions about what gets counted and from the analysis and presentation of data. Rather, they become the subjects of others' analysis. In this context, radical statistics should provide space for critique, but also ideally capacity building. So as part of what radical statistics does, as John has said, there's a journal, um, which has been to some extent a kind of anti-journal. It's aimed at a popular statistically literate audience. And it's required that authors employ less technical language and identify the common ground between disciplines and beyond academia. As such, its logic has typically run contrary to the formal constraints of academic publishing. And it's interesting that there are moments where it's been very hard to get people to publish, whereas there are moments like now where all of a sudden there is this impetus for people to engage in a new and different way. 
Um, and we've seen that as well in the radical statistics email list, which has burst into life in the recent pandemic, enabling the sharing of health statistics and data between data and analysts, but also medical practitioners who are just statistically literate. Um, and that's produced these really engaging debates about not just what the data were or the statistical analysis um, and shared modeling blogs in process and access to international sources, but it's also facilitated facilitate a discussion between um, these two groups of an analyst and practitioners about what's excluded or what just can't be counted. For, in, for instance, the extent to which health workers who are working or um, running on empty and are just unable to record data in any way that's meaningful because they're too rushed or too tired. And so where the gaps in this, these data are comes from that discussion and um, community between analysts and practitioners and people working on the ground. I think what Erin's already shown is this really wonderful example of a radical use of statistics um, and more importantly the kind of communication of these in a way that's really clear and engaging and incorporates text and images in revealing creative ways. And I love the crowdsourcing element and the integration of the presentation of data and the provision of access to support and resources which is brilliant. Um, but I think more generally as radical statistics or as radicals concerned with the use of statistics, we need to do much more to empower local community and radical political groups to produce and analyze their own statistics. These may not always be as beautiful as the anti-eviction maps, but I think without that capacity, we continue to perpetuate relations of data dependence. Um, and so kind of just as a last kind of final tangent, but in one of my other lives, I'm vice president of my local union branch. And within a week of our university moving to home working, we surveyed members on their experiences of working from home. And that meant that we had data on what was happening and produced our own report before the senior managers were able to and were negotiating from a position of knowledge um, and able therefore to fight for things that would make working conditions better. Now, obviously, university workers are a completely distinct group. But the more general point holds, and that is that the capacity to produce and analyze our own data is empowering. And I think that's kind of something that hopefully we will all kind of share. Great, thanks Rachel. Um, so now we'll move on to the, the historian side of the panel. Um, so we've got three panel historians. I think we're going to start with Guy, then move to Eddie and then to Oz. Uh, so first up is uh, our very own History Acts co-founder, Guy Beckett. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Hang on a sec. Okay, can everyone see that? All right. Uh, so, uh, my interest in statistics is uh, what they do to political debate and decision making. And my uh, research looks at the decades before the London Statistical Society that John was talking about. So, I'm going to begin with a brief introduction to this case history uh, and then give you some conclusions. So, sort of skipping a lot of the history aspect of this, actually. Um, so I'm going to start. We want to. Sorry. Okay. So um, the 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 case history that I was looking at was uh, statistics to do with widow burning in India. Uh, widow burning for people who haven't heard about it, which is sometimes known as sati or suti. Uh, it was the custom of a widow dying by burning on her husband's funeral pyre. It's not unique to India, but it's probably best documented there, where it's been known about since antiquity, uh, and it's described in numerous Indian and European texts. Uh, the custom is often described as voluntary, but uh, women took drugs or were drugged, and sometimes prevented from escaping the flames, as Peter Mundy's sketch from 1630 uh, demonstrates. It's therefore quite hard to map onto Western notions of suicide uh, or murder. Uh, but one of the key features of, of the period I'll be talking about is that it was not illegal at this point and actually for centuries before the British started collecting data on it was a highly valued and high status custom. Uh, the, when the East India Company began acquiring government powers uh, after the Battle of Plessy in 1757, initially widow burning was not seen as a practice uh, that, that needed to be managed in any way uh, and in fact, it was seen as a custom that defined the country's culture. Uh, and, and the Britons were also conflicted about whether it still even existed. Some argued that it was extinct, others that it was commonplace. So I'm going to talk now a bit about the, uh, the timeline of how statistics started to be generated on this question. 
Um, in 1797, uh, the, the East India Company estimated a number of burnings based on Indian estimates. And this was part of an attempt within the company by evangelical members of the company to shock the company into propagating Christianity. And then in 1802 to four, there was an unofficial survey of a small sample area that you can see on the map on the right. Uh, and this produced two sets of statistical data. Then from 1815 to 30, the British had a registration policy. Uh, and this is a very unusual period in British legal history. Uh, Indian widows were compelled to register with magistrates uh, before they uh, killed themselves on their husband's funeral pyres. Uh, and then they, and the British magistrates then authorized their right to burn if, if, if they assessed that the widow was doing this freely. Uh, so this was a form of state sanctioned suicide until the custom was banned, criminalized in 1830. And magistrates were required to note each, each case on, on the performer perform form on the right, uh, and, and then submit their annual uh, collection of form of data uh, to a central record office, uh, which was then counted to produce annual official widow, widow burning statistics for British India. Uh, from 1830, the British banned the custom, and then it became a criminal statistic, uh, which was counted by the British colonial state and is still counted by the Indian state. So there have been statistics of some kind or another officially from 1815 onwards. Uh, the, a key moment in the, in the political history is that the data was published uh, uh, at various points. So in 1805, the first unofficial surveys were published in London and then in Calcutta. And in 1821, the East India Company data uh, was published. Uh, it had uh, it had remained secret, uh, uh, but a, an MP, an evangelical MP, forced its publication. And from then on, uh, it became part of an ongoing evangelical campaign to show that Hinduism was not peaceful and that India needed Christianity. This data was published by Parliament in London, but it was circulated very widely in Western Europe, in India, and North America, and debated very widely. Uh, these were incredibly early social statistics, I mean, much earlier than national British suicide statistics, and they were an ongoing series, and they began at a very clear moment. So they're quite an interesting thing to look at in terms of what they did to political decision-making and to political debates, which is what I'll talk about now. And I'm just going to jump into a series, a series of conclusions, some of which I think speak to, to what's happening now, but others don't at all. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, timetabling. So it's quite well known with statisticians that the, uh, the frequency of account produces difficult, diff different empirical conclusions. But this case study also shows that timetables shape actions as well as findings. So at every level of the company, the production and publication of annual statistics created a timetable that repatterns how officials worked, how they made decisions, and how they were given instructions and information. So uh, we've talked a bit about, about the timetable of magistrates collecting information when it, when, it, when it occurred, and they submitted their data in the new year. The information was then aggregated in the spring. It was discussed in, uh, in the uh, sort of head offices of the East India Company in Calcutta in June, July, and sent to, U to the UK. And in November, it was published by the Parliament. This publication schedule also, also determined the timings of debates in the public sphere. So people who were organizing against the practice knew when the new data was coming. It also produced regular articles in newspapers that you can, you can you, you, once you start seeing the pattern, you know exactly when to look for the next year's article about the issue. Uh, and it also uh, affected when activists produced pamphlets. So one of the questions I've got with the uh, coronavirus data is, is, is this issue of this daily information and, 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 the, and the production of international comparative COVID data uh, is, is really, really fascinating, and I'm sure is driving how politicians and activists are responding. So, just to pursue that a little bit further, uh, this is the graph that I produced. Um, in, in this period, uh, people didn't really graph data. Um, there's a, I mean, uh, there's, that's a bit of a, some people did, but, uh, but it was relatively unusual. Um, uh, this is a graph that I produced of East India Company internal correspondence from 1787 to 1827. Um, 
So as you see, before the data starts coming in, which is, which is 1815, uh, British dealings with widows and their families were low frequency and sporadic. Uh, from 1810 onwards, what you see is a discussion about the preparation to collect data. And then from 1850, 1816 onwards, you get the first year's data delivered and then discussions about it. And you'll see that um, it took up increasing amounts of company time. Uh, managing the survey, interpreting the results, worrying about public opinion, developing schemes to bring the numbers down. And far more Britons encountered the practice. So in the 18th century, approximately 15 Britons witnessed widow burning, and now there were hundreds of, of, of British witnesses and magistrates encountering it every year. So the availability of stats massively drove up the activity around this issue in the company. Uh, in a minute, I'll be talking about the oscillations on the right-hand side of the graph and what, what they might mean. So, uh, uh, this is a fairly obvious point, I think, but worth stressing because I think it does speak to what's happening in the papers now. Uh, uh, prior to the statistics uh, being introduced, the past was seen as the main way to understand widow burning. So, East Indian Company employed an official historiographer and orientalist who studied the Indian culture of the past to try and understand the present. Uh, they also saw the present as relatively static, like a society that hadn't changed for thousands of years. Once they started, when they introduced the statistics, the counting, they wanted to get rid of the practice by making people register, and they started to see the present as something that could be acted upon. Uh, and that's exactly, I think, what the statistics are supposed to do now with COVID. Um, and they also started predicting future trends. Uh, the past and personal experiences of, of, of widow burning became far less important. Uh, trends and, 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 the, and the current state were, were the key questions that people talked about. So this produced, uh, the, uh, this was a target culture of a very crude sort. Uh, the registration was meant to reduce the prevalence of statistics. That was exactly why it was brought in. Uh, and in the first few years, there wasn't much concern about the numbers going up. The orange graph uh, shows the recorded numbers, the orange line, sorry. Um, and, uh, but but, but what, by 1819, when the 1818 figures uh, landed, uh, the increase in data was causing enormous internal concern because it appeared that in two to three years, the practice had doubled. And from that point on, from top to bottom, at every level of these in the company, uh, people were aware that these numbers should come down. And their anxieties became acute as they realized that public opinion in Britain, and to some extent India, was focused on the trends. How much officials worried fluctuated in response to whether the numbers were going up or down. And this led to some very, very extreme uh, official behavior. So the most extreme of all, I mean, there were lots and lots of different things that happened, but the most extreme was a thing called the New Pile, which was introduced by Captain Robertson in southern India. So figures were going up in his area when they were coming down in most, most surrounding areas, and he was put under enormous pressure to bring them down. So he introduced an official British design of funeral pyre, and this was designed to burn more slowly. Other areas introduced piles that burned more quickly. And the aim of the slow burning pile was to increase the pain and deter the burnings. And actually, he, he took measurements with his watch to make sure that it did burn more slowly. Uh, the scheme was widely praised at all levels of the company, right back to the head of the company, in, head, head, the heads of the company in London. And this was a new and distinctly statistical form of bureaucratic sadism, where pain was deliberately caused to enforce a numerically determined measure of social progress. So what I would say is that strong emotions are connected with successfully meeting targets. And if they're not being met, an institution can panic, becoming anxious, irrational, and highly contradictory in its behavior. So, uh, and if, if the problem persists, states can act violently. In this case, leadership in India became willing to sanction any policy that might reduce the number of burnings, however cruel. Uh, okay, sorry, I've got just a couple more conclusions. So one of the things that's often said about statistics is that they're transparent. Uh, very often you get tables of data that are published. But there's an interesting thing about uh, tables of data, which is that very few people actually look at them. I mean, they see the whole and, and they assume that they must be correct. And simple errors often go unchallenged. In this case, uh, 
uh, what we're looking at here on the left hand side is the same data uh, one's a, a German publication of it and the other is a British publication and the, and the numbers don't aren't the same it's 116 in one 115 in the other and the German one's actually correct but the 116 on the left is is, is wrong and circulated with the wrong total literally for for, for about five years before anyone noticed um, and and there's an interesting thing about statistics that no one really checks the numbers. Uh, reliability is taken on trust. I don't know if that's particularly relevant now, but there will definitely be some dodgy numbers circulating, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that the statistics did do was produce new experts on India. So before the numbers were published, old hands had a powerful hold within the company, and their first-hand knowledge of India was used to keep others away from policy decisions. And they were strongly against any form of religious interference. So the data created a new kind of expertise. Evangelical activists created the first surveys, and they were quick to make use of the official data in Charter Act debates and fundraising and single issue campaigning. Um, and, and then pro and anti widow burning campaigners in India and anti campaigners in Protestant Europe found trends and sociological patterns in the widow burning data, and they claimed to know more about India than East India Company employees. Individual experience, which used to trump all, was now damned valued. Now, this reminds me a bit of some of the surveys. I mean, it reminds me a lot of what we've just been hearing about with the tenants surveys. And, and in Britain, there's been a very successful deployment, deployment of domestic violence uh, surveys uh, under COVID. And I think there's an awful lot, there's, there are a lot of ways in which activists can, can, can use official data or create their own data to position themselves as new kinds of experts in crises. Uh, it also created uh, new forms of care and affection. So it's very striking that many women in Britain were moved to act by the statistics. They organised petitions in England, and these were the first example, very, very early examples of collective female political action. Uh, dissenters from middling and working backgrounds were also numerate enough to respond passionately to data. But the public cared about the number of burnings, worried the, co the company intensely. And when... Uh, uh, when Lord Bentick was appointed Governor General, he, he, he was, he'd been in Britain and he was clear that the company would have to change tack and ban the practice. He, was a, he, he went back to India aware that if he didn't do anything about it, he'd be accused of the British press of the crime of multiplied murder. Um, that's, stats were very powerfully motivating activists and can be used as powerful levers. Okay, that's me done. Great, thanks, Guy. So um, now we'll move on uh, to Edward Higgs. Eddie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, I'm very low tech. You're not going to get any um, um, PowerPoint, I'm afraid. Uh, just my handsome visage. A um, bit of background about me, first of all, where I come from, my interests. Um, I started out as a quality historian in the 1970s, uh, digitizing census data. Um, and then I worked in the National Archives in London for uh, about 15 years. Again, interested in making census records available to the public. And later on, uh, I was also involved in early discussions in international archives about um, archiving digital records. When I became an academic uh, historian, uh, I was interested in um, the history of statistical and data production, especially in the United Kingdom. Well, actually England, really. Uh, so I look, was looking at the General Register Office in the early 19th century, which was responsible for the setting up of systems of uh, registering births, marriages and deaths. Uh, and then moved on to looking at state information collection and database management in general. Then this led me on to an interest in the history of identification, how within statistics and in data production, uh, states uh, and commercial organisations actually identify individuals. My current research is um, actually about different sort of data altogether. It's about um, the collection of data on, on faces, facial profiling. Um, I'm very interesting in how uh, computer scientists uh, are at the moment 
um, trying to reduplicate really the work of people like Cesar Lombroso and Francis Galton in the 19th century by attempting to show uh, how you can use art, AR, artificial intelligence, to identify character in, in people's faces, to identify the uh, criminal uh, face. Um, barking, but um, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and what I'm trying to look at is how the idea of character in faces has developed over the well, millennia, actually, back to Aristotle, um, the Greeks. Um, I'm not going to present about my work. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the presentations we've had so far and to make some um, of general points uh, from my own work, uh, which may be of interest for uh, general discussion. Uh, first of all, the anti eviction movement. I thought this was fascinating. Uh, uh, well done, Erin. That's an excellent initiative. Um, and I like the way that the data is being used, to, not only to map, but to link to self-help uh, in local communities and um, to, to um, development of workshops. Very nice. Few things that struck me about this. Um, first of all, what, what a shambles um, United States of America is uh, in terms of uh, its data. Uh, it really is pretty appalling really it's almost third world in some ways uh, very dispersed information systems states running their own systems for registering births marriages and deaths all sorts of things um, and, and the only and um, there is also obviously a great deal of difference uh, within states and within um, metropolitan areas about how you apply statistics, how you collect statistics, and how um, uh, legislation related to rent control and the like varies from place to place in a way which, which in Europe um, seems very peculiar because we're much more used to the idea of, uh, of a nation state uh, undertaking these sorts of activities. Also, what comes out of uh, Erin's uh, discussion, it's something that comes up elsewhere, is that it really, what data is collected by the state really depends on what the state is interested in. And it's quite obvious that, say, in the United Kingdom, um, at least, well, no, no, and I think it's probably true for a long, long time, at least since the 80s, uh, the state's not very interested in people who rent, um, you know, what they're interested in is people who buy houses. And that's because um, certainly the, uh, the Conservative uh, Party has been interested in the idea of a property owning democracy. Um, and really people who rent um, are not of great interest so that the, the amount of data that's collected is, is comparatively small. And I'll come back to this later on when I talk about some other uh, contributions that have been made. The way in which you need to understand what the state is actually interested in. And that leads us on to all sorts of questions about power relations and the rest. Again, congratulations to the uh, radical statisticians. Um, I think it's wonderful work you've done and, and great initiatives. Um, some, some, um, some points to be made. Going back to the 1830s, what I think statistical methods in, in the UK certainly go back into the 17th century, uh, Gaunt and, and uh, Petty and people like that. What happens in the 1830s is that middle class professionals get control of the state, or at least they insert themselves into the state. And um, this is partly, I think, um, leads to thinking about the way Michel Foucault felt about um, the birth of the clinic, uh, uh, the way in which professionals use the state to actually gain power and authority. They might do useful things with it, uh, but there's also that way in which um, professional groups colonize the states for their own purposes. Um, 
demystify statistics. Now, now this is it's very, very interesting. One of the things I'm quite, it was very interested in when I wrote my book on the General Register Office was the way in which their great uh, statistician, uh, William Farr, introduced the concept of the healthy districts. And so it's a very simple thing. All he did was to say, well, this is what death rates are in agricultural areas. Um, and they're low. And these are what they are in urban districts where they're high. And then he said, if you had sanitary reform, uh, you would save all these excess deaths. And that was a very simple uh, use of statistics, but incredibly powerful because it then under pinned a lot of the public health movements of, of the 19th century. Um, again, there's a whole question of, uh, then of how these professional uh, uh, elites, if you like, cozy up to power. Um, and certainly statisticians in the 19th century were very concerned to cozy up to power. We only have to think of the statistical work of Florence Nightingale to see that. But of course, what cozying up to power does, and taking over the, uh, the statistical arm of the state does, is it gives them power to collect data and analyze it. And I think there's this, uh, there's this um, tension between being able to get data, not having to rely on um, localized groups, which may not be able to uh, collect data consistently, and the power of the central state to do this. Um, statistics is not necessarily in the 19th century about, well, it is about social amelioration, but it was to give um, state power. William Farr, for example, was quite open that um, being able to use statistics to improve the loss of the population was to ensure that the population didn't get uppity. It was about ways of control. Later on in the century, of course, um, you get statisticians such as Francis Galton, who are far more concerned with um, you know, eugenics, racial control, and all these sorts of stuff, where this form of um, professional control of society gets even stronger. Um, Again, um, who has data and can you trust them? This depends a lot upon how far you trust bodies like Facebook and Google, uh, or uh, you trust the state. And states are different. Uh, I have far more um, trust, say, in the Norwegian statisticians than I would in the UK statisticians. Um, it's quite true that the Nazis in the 1930s used the 1930 census of Germany uh, to introduce control and eventual eradication of the Jewish population. But on the other hand, the British used um, uh, the, what, what was going to be the 1941 census to, to set up a national register which helped it um, organize society so it could actually defeat the Nazis. So we have to think about the differences between states and bodies. Statistical literacy. Um, this is, I think, absolutely essential. Um, it's very difficult for the general public um, to gain, say, statistics. I mean, I know this from students I've taught at, at university who are not stupid people, but don't understand graphs. What's an axis? You know, that means nothing to them. Um, but there is a problem, and that is how far statisticians and scientists in general actually want people to understand statistics, because statistics gives them power. Uh, if, a famous uh, example of this was in um, during the Star Wars uh, campaign uh, under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And this, the scientists were showing how lasers could blow things up. Uh, but they said, well, we haven't, we're not, we're not, we've not got power, enough power. Uh, we need power to the, uh, the power 10. We've only got it up to the power five. Oh, said the generals, you're halfway there give you some more money. Um, statisticians, uh, the, the scientists said nothing. 
okay? So we have to ask ourselves not only what the states want, but what the statisticians want. Um, and lastly, on, on Guy's point about um, the way in which statistics uh, rebound on bureaucracies and governments, yes, they do. Uh, it's quite obvious. If you look at the UK government reaction to COVID, an awful lot of it is really not about anything to do with controlling the, um, the pandemic. It's about winning the public relations battle. And that under, underpins a lot of what goes on in the nature of their statistical production and the way they handle their statistics. Now, I've got a lot, I could say a lot more, uh, but I will leave it there because I hope I've given people enough um, ideas uh, which we might discuss further in uh, when we come to questions and, and answers. And by the way, uh, I should um, congratulate the organisers of this whole event on, on an excellent initiative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. Um, yeah, so finally from our panel, before we do go to discussion, we've got Oz Frankel. Hi, uh, I'm Oz Frankel. I'm the chair of the history department at, uh, in the New School for Social Research in New York. I'm hailing from Brooklyn right now, actually. Thanks for inviting me. I'm new to this forum. Um, I was incredibly impressed by the two activist projects. And I think these are incredibly valuable, but also imaginative projects. I congratulate you. I have very little to do, to say, obviously I have very little to do, do, but also to say about the, the intricacies of those two projects. Uh, but I think they are incredibly important and, and show some example of how to do things uh, um, uh, right now uh, and how to move ahead also politically, not just in terms of accumulating uh, information, but uh, explaining and disseminating and registering. Um, I also want to thank Guy for the way he intertwined uh, history and statistics. I think uh, statistics has been sort of part and partial of how we think historically in modernity and something that we should keep in mind. But also that statistics should not uh, be separated completely with other modalities of knowledge production. Um, they, they should always be part of a larger context and a, and a larger politics of knowledge. Um, I believe that I was invited for this forum because uh, more than 10 years ago I published a book called States of Inquiry um, that uh, uh, examined, explored the in informational function of the modern state in 9th century in Britain and the United States. In Britain, this focused largely on uh, parliamentary, parliamentary hearings, the uh, Royal Commission of Inquiry, but also on the um, immense uh, uh, efforts to disseminate information through blue books. So it became part of the part and parcel of the function of the modern state to generate and circulate information with, with sometimes unexpected results uh, that both strengthened but, but weakened uh, the modern state. I'll say something about that in a second. Um, I'm a historian. And so I think about history and it's a strange time to think about history because I think that the, the present commandeers our attention um, in a radi radical way. But I also want to remind us that we are called upon now to witness history, that is to observe and register and preserve history. And also that the current public uh, exchange, the public conversation is suffused with uh, allusions, some explicit but many implicit, to history and historicity. We constantly talk about rupture and emergencies uh, and crisis or try to find some continuity in all, all of those con constructs of ideological uh, strings attached to them. They are all highly politicized uh, and, and we cannot I, I believe uh, sort of separate knowledge and its production from politics. I think it's something we should be aware of. Uh, we also have to contend, certainly in the United States and maybe elsewhere as well, with the fact that uh, you know, people like Trump and Jared Kushner are also uh, uh, historians of sort in the sense that they are taught, constantly try to rewrite history, especially recent history, but also sort of uh, long-term history. And I think these efforts to distort the, the, the record has to be resisted uh, to the best of our ability. 
I wish, for instance, that this uh, information that was uh, you know, shared with us was, would also be brought to the attention of historians, current historians and future historians. I think this is, this is a very important political work that, that you are doing that should be, become uh, as visible as possible. The second point I want to make is, uh, I think, uh, especially in response to John's remarks, is that uh, facts, reason, literacy, it's, it's sometimes mind boggling that we are still fighting, 250 years later, we're still fighting the Enlightenment project. Uh, and we became, became its defenders. Um, knowing full well that in the 19th, 20th century, those values and the technology, statistics or other technologies as well, were used for the purpose of uh, creating hierarchies, exclusions, empires, uh, modern state. And, and this is actually a very tall order, how to fight for facts, reason and literacy, knowing the complicated history of those values and, and, those, and those practices. Um, and in this context, coming back to the 1830s and those statistical societies, they were, they were used in part to incubate the state's uh, knowledge apparatus, right? And, and, and for the, all of those purposes, the rise of the middle class, uh, class certification, empire, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm actually concerned, it doesn't sound very radical or very progressive, I'm actually concerned about the devolution and dismantling of the state knowledge apparatus. Um, and coming back to the historical example to the 1830s, 1840s, uh, and to the idea that numbers, I think I mentioned that, numbers do not speak for themselves, is that the state never had full uh, control over the production and dissemination of, of the knowledge she engaged, uh, it engaged with. Um, and, and many oppositional organizations, trade unions and others, actually use the, the, the data produced by the state for purposes that were inimical to the purposes of the state. It became part of oppositional politics to critique the state through its knowledge apparatus statistics, blue books, and, and, and what have you. And also many organizations, not necessarily middle class uh, statistical societies, but trade unions and other organizations develop their own knowledge apparatus. Um, and we're all familiar with the example of how Marx and Engels used blue books to, to make an argument that was not necessarily friendly to the state. So I, I see in the state knowledge apparatus some baseline um, that can generate a critique and oppositional kind of discourse that can be beneficial. I think part of what we need to do is not just generate alternative uh, knowledge, but also critique official knowledge. Uh, and this critique uh, obviously is also an important uh, political project. I'll end here, thank you. Great, thanks. Sir. So, uh, yeah, that leaves us about 45 minutes for uh, questions and discussion. Um, so the way this will work, um, I did explain at the beginning, but if people have just arrived, so if you want to speak, uh, if you can write to me privately in the chat, so if you drop down to the bottom, you can open a chat window and then you can drop down and message just me, Stefan Blaney. Um, and if you just write your name, then I'll call on people in the order that they speak. Um, there's quite a lot of people in the in the chat tonight and there's a big panel so if people can keep it as brief as possible um yeah and i'll, I'll take a, a few questions at the same time so i've already got a couple of people to call on but if you if you want to speak please do send me your name so i'll take zora and then i'll take uh, allison hi uh Thank you. I have been listening and taking notes, and uh, this has been really interesting for me personally. Um, I will just mention a couple things. There are lots of things that I'd like to talk about because all of this has been so interesting to me. But a couple things. One is that, um, first of all, I think a lot of us can thank statistics for the fact that we are even present here today because uh, public health as um, 
was earlier mentioned by uh, Edward uh, played a big role in essentially keeping a lot of people not just healthy but alive, including um, its uh, influence on uh, uh, child mortality and infant mortality and all of that, and then immunizations and all. Um, so um, one, uh, this last uh, talk uh, by Oz, uh, this reminded me of the plagues and the fact that, at least in the UK, which I have studied, uh, the plagues and keeping records uh, of uh, people who were dying of the plagues uh, played a big role in the emergence of statistics, um, which I have documented. But, uh, and it, this has kind of made me think in uh, recent months about what uh, sort of influence this new plague, this new pandemic will have on our uh, ways of knowing, um, including statistical ways of knowing. Um, in relation to what um, Aaron, I guess, mentioned earlier, um, I just wanted to point to something that from an activist point of view, um, it's a bit of a par um, paradox because on the one hand, when you're looking at, um, for instance, ethnicity and race in relation to eviction, so how are these projected in statistics or not projected? Or right now, someone else mentioned uh, COVID deaths and if ethnicity is, I think it was Rachel who mentioned that, is recorded and how is it recorded and how is it known? Um, from my studies of history of statistics, uh, statistics um, is not morally neutral in the sense that once you shine the light on any population through statistics, um, you are, um, whether you want it or not, you are also moralizing and subjecting that population to moral judgments. So on the one hand, it's interesting to say, yes, for instance, COVID affects um, certain ethnicities more than others, as people have said, for instance, in the UK these days about, for instance, the number of ethnic doctors who have died. Um, or for instance, evictions impact um, minorities more than others because of various reasons. Part of it because they may not be able to pay. All of these essentially, on the one hand, invite uh, kind of critical scrutiny of why are these people more impacted and what are the forms of social inequality that um, uh, kind of exacerbates the effect of COVID or uh, income inequality. But on the other hand, it also kind of casts these populations in a negative light in the sense that, well, are these populations less hygienic? than the rest and is this why they are dying and i've already seen references um in uh, for instance in the uk where they are talking about these doctors who died uh, from covid uh, to for instance practices within these ethnic populations which is sometimes code for they are just not as clean as us, as the rest of us. And the same with people who are evicted uh, because of not being able to pay rent and, and other things. So I just want to, um, this is not something that we can necessarily solve in the sense that, you know, once you start pointing out these statistical disparities, you are inviting moral judgments of populations, but I think it's really important to be mindful um, and, and this is throughout the history of statistics. There is, in fact, as you might know, uh, sociology at some point earlier on, um, it was interested in moral statistics. So moral statistics and morality were really uh, intertwined and they are still intertwined. So I would be very mindful of, of that hazard of, of um, sh shining light on some of these problems. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, so next up, we had uh, Alison.
Uh, you're, you're still muted, Alison. There you go. Right. Hello, I'm Alison McFarlane and I'm a long, um, long standing member of Radical Statistics and um, I think uh, John and Rachel have given a good account of what we've done. I'd like to add a few things, um, uh, particularly um, of our work on health statistics and how it also illustrates some of the points that have um, been taken up. One is certainly the challenging misuse of statistics by government to mislead and um, sometimes can have long and um, knock-on effects. Uh, we did a lot of this um, in the 1980s where the Thatcher government was claiming that the health um, service was um, growing and extending and we uh, showed that um, not only was she cutting it, it wasn't keeping pace with changes in the population. Um, out of um, this um, a book we put together, um, because it gave examples of this and because it got reported um, in the national press and in a major television um, uh, um, program, uh, it, it contributed to a movement um, at the time saying we need a more independent statistical service. Thatcher had just had the statistical service reviewed and said government statistics um, exist only to serve the needs of government. Um, and over a longer period, um, this um, has led to a more independent statistical service, uh, which says that it is producing statistics for the public good and has a code of practice. Now, of course, um, this has needed uh, um, vigilance and um, people reporting to the people maintaining this code of practice um, breaches of it. Um, uh, but uh, it says at least puts more scrutiny on government statistics and there's a question about can, is it at all possible for government to produce statistics that we can trust? Um, another, looking at the um, uh, COVID situation, um, there's another issue that debate about um, whether we can rely on this app that um, Rachel mentioned or um, do we actually need to do um, uh, uh, contact tracing, um, which is a long-standing um, practice in public health dating back to the 19th century. If you read on um, reports of Barr and his contemporaries, that is what they did. Having set up a system for the registration of deaths, um, it was not only used nationally, but it was used locally to monitor disease. And, as Eddie said, Far has uh, Far wrote about that. It was um, the um, second paragraph of his report on the 1849 cholera epidemic um, pointed out the huge differences between areas and their rates of cholera. And I think we, if we had the data at that level, we would find that today. Um, as the public health movement went on, um, there were. Um, development of um, uh, the post of a medical officer of health who was responsible for the health, public health of his or her, usually well, would be his of those days, area, and compiling other statistics as the services uh, developed, um, and particularly the call for trying to get statistics for the notification of communicable diseases. Without going on, uh, going into detail, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, um, had a system where these local officials um, um, compiled reports of, of the health of their local areas um, and a lot of these locally collected statistics fed into what was published nationally. Um, what had happened after we, um, uh, when we were a few years into the National Health Service, the post of Medical Officer of Health um, was um, abolished and the um, public health surveillance um, gradually um, got disseminated around and, and broken up into different areas of the health service. And over the period since 1973, we've had numerous what I call re-disorganizations of the health service, which have basically led to a service which is more fragmented, in one say it's more fragmented with more privatization and on the other hand, more centralized. 
Um, so when the government started to collect data um, about the COVID epidemic, um, it, in England at least, um, it set up ad hoc, ad hoc um, collections from different organisations and none of this passed through any local organisation, it was all went to different national organisations um, and they clearly didn't pilot it. They, want, um, they wanted it um, to be, be able to have some numbers to present every day at their national um, uh, performance. Um, so the um, statistics produced every week um, based on civil registration since 1837 weren't thought to be quick enough. Um, these statistics, they, um, they, it was very difficult to describe where they were come, where they come from, how they collected them. Um, and uh, I'm writing the, the article on sources of data for the next issue of Radical Statistics, but I have to keep changing it because further information comes um, as they're sort of forced to commit more information and they keep moving the goalposts and changing what they're collected. Um, the, um, the, the, the daily performances where the minister presents statistics are a flagrant violation of the code of practice because there's so much distortion where um, um, statistics were press released by ministers um, that um, code of practice said that um, they should be presented by the statistician who signed them off. Um, that is, that's been uh, fragrantly um, uh, disregarded in order to have statistics um, produced by a minister on every day of the week, even though reporting varies by day of the week, so it distorts the statistics. Finally, when we get to the um, uh, position of um, how we're going to do uh, the surveillance uh, with all this testing, which is um, mainly being outsourced to a whole lot of different private companies and another lot that producing the app. Um, the local directors of public health don't have access um, to local data, which is exactly what they need to do the job, um, uh, because it has all be gone past them nationally. And now um, instead of local people doing the searching and tracing, we don't know who they're going to get in. It looks like they're advertising Circo or someone to come in and do it rather than um, people who are local and out of jobs and uh, do a better, better job. So um, there's a whole lot of that um, we can't even trust the coronavirus statistics um, that have been collected for our own country and it's difficult to find out what they are. The more reliable ones are the one, the series that date back to 1837. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, yes, so, uh, so does anyone on the panel want to respond to that? So, Erin, maybe you want to come in on the, the question about the sort of the paradox or the ambivalence of collecting statistics and how they might be used against you or, or alternative narratives coming up. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for, uh, this was really fascinating to hear everybody's presentations. Um, am I, I might be frozen, am I frozen? Okay. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think my connection just got weak, but um, no, I think the question about race and statistics is really fascinating. And again, I'm not a historian of, of statistics and I'm not a statistician myself, but um, of course we deal with, with numbers and statistics, uh, particularly in looking at who's being evicted. Um, so interestingly, the city itself doesn't collect any information about um, race and eviction. It just, we, the data we get to map evictions comes from um, rent boards and from courts, uh, where we just basically get an address uh, and the date of an eviction. Um, we have to, they also don't tell us who the landlord is. So we have to basically merge that data with parcel ownership data and then with corporate secretary of state data in order to figure out the LLCs um, and, and the landlords behind eviction. So that's something that the city and the state wants to keep private in order to protect the interest of, um, 
of real estate. They also though don't give us any information about who's being evicted, which is good. We don't we don't want tenant information to be um, something that can be used to exploit tenants. Although there are now private tenant screening companies that are doing this. The the way that we can figure out uh, who's being evicted according to race is by working with different tenant clinics and legal services that represent tenants. Um, so we can uh, work with them to go over their client intake data to, to figure out that indeed black tenants are overrepresented by 300% um, in San Francisco alone when it comes to evictions. Um, Latinx tenants are also highly overrepresented. Um, and that data, yeah, I, I can definitely see how it could be used to, to say something like, oh, well, because it, they're, they're, I, I, the moral language that you mentioned, I think is really interesting, particularly around fault evictions. He's evicted for committing some sort of fault of not being able to pay rent. Um, that can be highly racialized and racializing and can indeed be um, uh, used in, in a racist way to say, oh, like black tenants can't pay their rent and, and therefore should be evicted. But because we're looking at this structurally and historically, we're able to say, well, actually, um, we can look at these histories of redlining and redevelopment. Uh, I mean, we can go back as far as we want to understand how this moral language is racist and, and problematic. Um, and, and we're basically producing these numbers not to reproduce that moralization, but rather to uh, fight an anti-racist uh, struggle for housing justice and to show that we need to think about race um, and we need to think about histories of racism and racialization um, in order to come up with an analysis of, of housing injustice and, and in fighting for housing justice. So I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it there, but it, it's it, yeah, it's a fascinating um, uh, issue, and, and I'd love to continue to talk about it. So. Yeah, uh, thanks, Erin. Um, yeah, before I ask anyone else from the panel to jump in, um, please do keep putting your name in the chat if you want to speak. I would uh, remind people again to, from the floor to try and keep your your contributions as brief as possible, so we can get as much in as possible. We've got about half an hour left, but um, did any of our panelists uh, want to come in on the points raised from the floor before we go back? Can I just make a small point? John Bibby speaking. Yeah, go ahead, John. Um, and the small point I want to make is really um, looking forward from here, I think it's been a very interesting meeting. Where do we go from here? What sorts of collaboration between radical statistics and history acts and the other people who are here can I actually take from this meeting? Uh, either things that are specifically related to COVID or things that are longer term. Uh, I feel I've had my say, uh, so I just wanted to raise that. But I do know that in the audience, there's several people from Radical Statistics, and they may well have a different perspective. I, I've noticed Wendy Olson is there, and David Byrne, and David Lamb. So I wonder whether maybe you could call on Wendy if she wants to speak, because she, she's always got something interesting to say. Um, so we, we've got a queue of people, but if Wendy wants to, if Wendy wants to jump in, she can put her name in the chat. So if Wendy, you want to message me, um, we have a question or a comment from Simon. Hi. Um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, and the, the stuff on race is is very relevant to my masters. I'm looking at um, the disturbances or riots or uprisings in um, Brixton and around the country in the 80s, Scarman, what happened in the 80s and 90s to sort of produce Stephen Lawrence murder and McPherson introduced racism. So what I want to know is some tips on what, what would be good stats to sort of try and disentangle race and class. So they're very much painted as sort of race riots uh, by the government, by Life to the media, well, by, by everyone really. Um, but you know, there's perhaps a, a strong argument to say it was kind of class based as well. Um, how different is it really from the poll tax riot? Similar grievances, that sort of thing. So, yeah, just disentangling sort of tips on where to look specifically um, on that sort of um, front, really, please. Great. Right, um, so I've got no one in the queue. So uh, if anyone wants to come back on that, and uh, if anyone does have more questions or perhaps uh, suggestions on John's question about where we go from here, uh, just message me in the chat. But uh, does any of the historians maybe want to come back on Simon's question? Do just unmute and jump in.
Uh, okay, so maybe you need I've, I've, stum I've stumped you all. <laughs> I mean, I as, can't, not as a, sorry, Rachel. Um, go on, Rachel. Not as a historian, but as a sociologist who once upon a time studied history. Um, sorry, I don't know if you can see me very well. It's light hat next to me. Um, I think that it raises some really interesting questions about what isn't studied and what isn't measured. And clearly, one of the things that very rarely gets measured is protests. Um, you know, we rely on police statistics or organizers' data to tell you how many people are there. And nowadays we can measure protests through social media engagement, but it's much more difficult <coughs> to measure real life people in places. Um, and certainly to uh, characterize them in particular ways and uh, retrospectively provide identities for them. So you can't, I mean, I don't think that, I think the answer to your question of what stats is probably there aren't stats. Um, there might be, you know, there's participants um, reports, you have newspaper accounts, but of course those all have the problematic elements that you've already raised. Um, and I think one of the things that people have already highlighted in terms of especially race is that um, statistics are uh, very much implicated in the process of racialization, but there's also struggles of um, ethnic groups over being both being counted and not being counted and so it's always highly complex and contested um, and it goes back to that thing about who counts and who ch and who decides what to count and what can be counted and it's not always everything um, lots of things are kind of uncountable and that's in itself important because any data analysis that relies on only what can be counted is always only partial Hey, thanks, Rachel. Uh, Savannah. Hey, um, yeah, thanks everyone for really uh, fascinating um, uh, talks. Um, I had a question for Erin. Erin, um, um, yeah, I was just wondering about, um, I guess generally, like over the course of um, uh, your like group's history, but particularly now during COVID-19 when um, we're all obviously in our houses almost all of the time. Um, I was just wondering about how you like get information out to people um, who might not be online or who might not be as kind of computer literate um, and also how you gather information. So um, I'm, well, I've recently joined the, the London Mentors Union here. Um, and so like really interested in the work that you guys are doing over there. Um, but yeah, this is something that we're kind of thinking about and dealing with is how to involve people even just in meetings who like might not, um, be able to use Zoom or you know whatever it might be, but I was just interested in, in I guess, accessibility offline in, in terms of your work. Thanks. Great, okay, thanks, Seth. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Should I respond? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, please do. Oh, okay, okay. Um, no, I think that's a great question, and it's something we have been struggling with um, a lot. Uh, not just our group, but I think a lot of groups and. Um, yeah, there are many people who don't have access to Zoom. Um, I mean, a lot of housing orgs are doing these like online town halls and are doing all of these, these Zoom meetings, but that requires um, some proficiency uh, with the technology and, and access to the technology. Um, so there have been a lot of efforts to um, do different mailings, like people are writing, um, like tenant rights, how to write letters to your landlord. Um, uh, letters and uh, distributing them to different people's homes. There's been a lot of flyering on um, different uh, buildings and lampposts and, and things like that. Um, there are, because there are longstanding tenant organizations um, that have people's phone numbers, there's just been a lot of people calling and doing a lot of outreach on the phone um, and a lot of new hotlines that have gone up. Um, in multilingual hotlines which have been um, coordinating food and um, access to different information so that's been really important um, and there have been also there have, we have had a lot of protests there were a lot of mayday protests um, that involved people gathering but maintaining physical distance um, there was an occupation of a home in san francisco that was vacant uh, by by two houseless folks and so there are these in person gatherings that are happening but it's it's still precarious because nobody wants to get anybody um, sick at, or exposed but um, there have been a lot of car protests where people uh, protest in cars and put signs uh, on their cars and uh, there was a big caravan on May Day past the mayor's home um, uh, so yeah things like that but it's 
it's pretty ad hoc and I think we're all like learning as we go and realizing um, that there, there are huge issues in terms of everything being digital right now. Um, I've got uh, no no names in the chat, so I'm gonna use can the chat back, to. I'll Stephen, go can, I come, can I come back to the point that Simon and then Rachel uh, made about race and statistics, and, and and I think we just need to acknowledge the statistics. Statistics is not necessarily the best tool to deal with ambiguities of identity, and, and therefore there are things that statistics can do very well, and there are things that it's not very capable of doing. Um, at the same time, statistics always had this kind of totali totalizing aspirations. I mean, when it was uh, sort of semi-discovered in the 1820s, 1830s, uh, there were people who thought that everything can be quantifiable. And uh, the statistical societies de dealt uh, sometimes inventively uh, or playfully with all kinds of numbers, you know, a number of uh, umbrellas in a particular locale, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but I, th I think what, what should be done, I think part of it, I know it's not very exciting, is reflex reflexivity, understanding that this is a tool that can be very powerful, but also sometimes crude. And that we use categories that uh, can highlight uh, uh, inequality, but also can be used for the purpose of exclusion. Uh, that uh, should be clear to all of us. Great, thanks. I've got. Uh, Can I cut, just come in on that? Uh, yeah, go on, Edward. Then I'll then I'll take uh, David after that. Uh, well, just to say very briefly that that categories can change, uh, and they're slippery things. Uh, one of the things that the British government does a lot of is 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 recording ethnicity. Now, I've changed my ethnicity in the last year. I've suddenly become Irish. I've got my. I've got my Irish passport. I'm Irish. Before I was British white. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well done, mate. Um, so categories can change. And that's one of the problems with categories, that they're very slippery things. Um, and as we've seen over COVID, what you define as a death from COVID changes depending on the venue and, and who's organizing statistics. Sorry to interrupt. No, thanks. Uh, uh, David was going to come in. Uh, I think you're muted, David. You can, there you go. Yeah, you go. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's a couple of things. One is to really follow up on something that Alison McFarland said. You can't separate the COVID experience from what's been happening to the English National Health Service in the English context, right? Because after the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, it was plain that the English National Health Service was being set up for privatization in the sense of the, there would be a whole series of private providers who would tap into state revenues and deliver health care. And actually, COVID has demonstrated a lot of issues that relate to that. And it's interesting that that hasn't just happened at a national level in relation to COVID, which is a real crisis. I think it's a real crisis for the neoliberal privatizing state. Yeah, it's actually causing a lot of problems. But if you look at a lot of local episodes where statistics are used as well, there have been a lot of health service reconfigurations in the UK. And statistical evidence has been deployed as a rationale for these kinds of changes. Now, it's, 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 it's a complicated business, but it's, it's interesting how decision makers try to convince themselves that they're doing the right thing. For example, there was a big reconfiguration of health services in Greater Manchester, which basically meant that Rochdale lost a lot of its e and &E. And Rochdale has a large ethnic minority population. It also lost maternity services. These had really quite big implications for the way people live. So I think that this kind of ongoing political dispute matters. But the key thing about COVID is that it actually has been a hell of a shock to the kind of state system that we have. It's plain from some of the descriptions in the science and the history that we've had COVID-like events. This Russian flu thing that was supposed to have happened in the 19th century seems to have been like that. But the consequences in terms of what states are supposed to deliver, I think, is a big deal. One final thing I'll say is there are other organizations besides states that are playing statistics now. Think tanks, I think, are an extremely important set of actors 
who make a lot of use of statistical information in all kinds of ways. There's only one thing count on the left in relation to health, and that's the Center for Health and the Public Interest, which is crowdfunded. The other thing is the big international organizations like OECD. Now they rely on data which is generated by national statistical services, but there are enormous repositories now of enormous amounts of data. And actually what's really interesting is that OECD, for example, has become very, very frightened about inequality. Whereas in the relatively recent past, it was one of the great promoters of the kind of neoliberal agendas which have exacerbated inequality. So I think that you know we have to look both down and up when we're handling statistics. Great. Uh, does anyone from the panel want to come in on those points? Yeah, Guy, go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, it was slightly to, 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 to sh uh, it was responding to what people have been talking about uh, in a more general sense rather than the last point, actually, which is just, um, I suppose I, I, I'm back to my point about timetabling uh, and, and the effect of daily statistics on, on, on the current crisis, which I find really fascinating um, because in the era that I look at, people had plenty of time to think about the statistics and respond and write papers and argue about them before the next year's results came in. Whilst with these ones, I feel like we're being asked to sort of wait and submit. We're in a sort of intellectual lockdown as well as uh, a physical lockdown. Um, and so this is clearly produced anxiety. I mean, you know, that's like numbering things. I mean, any football fan will tell you that as you get towards the end of the season, whether, how well your team's gonna do. It's patently obvious. Anyone dealing with ref ratings or there's a great book on uh, 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 ratings and the uh, and law schools in the states and anxiety and statistics. And um, this is an incredibly anxious situation, and and we're we're all getting expert on on what seems like it's empirical, but is actually a model. Uh, so so you know you have Johnson squashing the sombrero, which is what we're trying to do to get you know to, to beat the beat the graph. Um, and I just wonder what what uh, other people think about that. Um, whether uh, I mean, I, I see, for example, that the graphing of it is a sort of is the more popular version at the moment, and then the R numbers are perhaps a more complex middle class analysis. Um, and so, so you know, people get and you get quite. I mean, there's quite a nerdy article in the Review of Books about R numbers this week, and I, I guess there's a whole bunch of people who've never thought about those before, uh, and lots of people are becoming sort of amateur epidemiologists. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of questions now for general politics about how we deal with the current, uh, the, 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 this avalanche of, of very speedy information. Uh, yeah, if anyone on the panel wants to come come back on that, we've got just a few minutes left. So um, maybe I can ask the panel to, to respond to that and maybe give some final thoughts as well. So. Um, uh, if no one's keen to jump in, I'll, I'll start calling on people. So go on, Ed. Um, well, generally, I, I mean, we're in a different type of culture now, aren't we? I mean, most of the, the stuff I've looked at in the 19th century is essentially a print culture. Um, data can be brought together, elaborated, printed. It may take months and months, year, not years, to get material out. The difference we're having now is that we have um, things that are coming out daily and people are discussing this daily uh, online uh, uh, and in the print media. And in one level, that's a good thing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also, there's an awful lot of crap out there. I mean, let's face it. Uh, it uh, we go back again to something somebody uh, raised earlier. How do we develop statistical literacy? I mean, again and again. I mean, I'm coming back to this thing what my students don't understand graphs. I mean, squashing the sombrero, I mean, doesn't mean anything because they don't understand axes. Um, how do we get around that? And I think that's something that radical statistics, st statisticians of all sorts, need to think very carefully about. So I'm not going to deal specifically with 
what students do or don't understand. But my, I would say that students can understand a lot more than we initially think they can. And there is a kind of acceptance of not understanding numbers, which gets reproduced. Um, what I really wanted to respond to though was what Guy was saying, which was about um, the, daily, the daily production of numbers and the speed with which analysis has to be done and how that affects the kind of amateur analysis and professional analysis that is happening. And one of the things I think that's happening is you see an exacerbation of inequalities in who is able and to or capable, and when I go back to this idea of capacity, who has the capacity to do the analysis. And then most of the amateur analysts have actually come from Silicon Valley. They are white men who don't have any childcare responsibilities, who are otherwise well paid and have time on their hands, as well as the knowledge capacity to do some amount of analysis. And so we've seen this huge rise in blogs by a certain class and um, group of men. It is overwhelmingly men, and it's mostly men of a particular from a particular set of um, occupations who are not experts but then start to claim the expert space and I think that looking at how that amateur production happens during a period of constrained capacity where some groups have even less time than they previously had um, as well as fewer other kinds of resources knowledge um, etc is really interesting and I think it is going to speak to the kinds of analyses that happen and that don't happen um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's going to require the collectivization of other people's um, capacity in order to counter that to some extent. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I'll just ask for final thoughts from Oz if he has any to share and then I'll go back to uh, John and Aaron to close out. Yes, just to respond to Rachel and Guy, I think what we have today, one of our problems is excess of information. Uh, it's moving very fast, but in also moving uh, in great volume. Uh, and, you know, in the States, I believe in Britain too, there's, there's a bubble phenomenon. I think part of the story, and again, it's a, it's a difficult issue to raise with a group of individual, individuals who are committed to egalitarian politics, is the lack, the absence of authority, um, a kind of um, expertise, a, or kind of status that could persuade parts of the, the public or different constituencies of one's interpretation and one's knowledge um, about those matters. And, and since, again, since the state has lost its authority and, and sometimes for a good reason, the question is how to establish a counter authority. And I think, the, and I think Rachel already gestures toward that. We need some alliance of different organizations that work in some kind of collaboration uh, to establish a, a expertise or authority uh, and then to sway uh, 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 communities or, or part of the public. Uh, because otherwise we would just be inundated with numbers and people who think they can actually sort of understand those numbers. Um, it's, it's a huge undifferentiated mess. Um, that then allows someone like, again, coming back to uh, Donald Trump to actually reject uh, science, statistics, or any of that, and just move with his intuition. Thanks, Oz. Uh, John, did you want to say some concluding words? Yeah, well, just a few words. Um, I'd like to concur with virtually everything that Rachel said, uh, in particular that I don't think people are as uh, ununderstanding. I think they understand more than um, they're often given credit for. And sometimes a good metaphor can enhance that understanding. I mean, I'm not sure I like the sombrero metaphor, but at least people are <laughs> talking about it and seeing a bit what it means. And similarly, the R value is a vast oversimplification. But um, the things that COVID has done that I find really rather amazing, I mean, in many ways, it's turned the world upside down. It's certainly been a it's been a good crisis for statisticians. <laughs> it's raised the profile of numbers massively. It's raised the profile. I think it's also raised the participation and participation in sort of everyday vocabulary as well. But the timeliness that Guy emphasized is extremely important, I think. And that's one of the key things that affects the value of, of information of all sorts, in particular statistical information. I mean, we're, we're used to, and perhaps historians particularly, 
are used to, as it were, unchanging data, and it's going to be the same next year as it is this year, and it's not really going to be used for a decision making anyhow. But clearly, a lot of the data that's coming out now, some of it at least, is very vital. Uh, you know, if you get the R value wrong by 0.05, that could be X number of deaths. I don't know how, how many exactly, but it, it has implications for life and death. Um, but also, the data we're being given, just to come back to Oz's point about the glut of data, some of it is incredibly repetitive, and I feel that this is calculated. I mean, these five o'clock um, Hancock half hours, as we call them, the, the, um, the, the, the press conferences at Downing Street, uh, are so repetitive. I mean, they generally start off saying, well done, everybody. They refer to the transport statistics, which really, in terms of their content, are weeks out of date now. I mean, they might have been brought a bit up to date, but nothing really has changed except perhaps marginally. Uh, but there's lots of data that they don't give us. For a long time, they didn't tell us about any deaths except outside hospitals. There's still 